welcome to Fans of the Forge. We are recapping Master of Arms Season 1, Episode 4, The Blunderbuss. Blunderbuss. So, starting off with Three Smiths, Lee Shaver, Master Gunsmith with 35 years of experience. 15 grandkids. Not bad. Says he could build a gun with a pocket knife if he had to. I would like to see somebody do that. All right. I would love to see Lee do that. It would be pretty impressive. Okay. Challenge... Extended. Extended. <laughs> Moving on to Brian Clark, the gun doctor. Uh, is his nickname. Specializes in restorations, including one from 1640. Impressive. And Nick Garrett, specializing in historical and competitive handguns. So the quick draw challenge for this week is our Smiths are given five hours to make an 18th century Native American gun stock war club. Damn. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> That was bad ass. I didn't know anything like that existed. No, mm-hmm. I had no idea. Uh, blew me away. So, it is shaped like a musket and has a spear point jutting out from the elbow. It was used by Eastern Woodland and Northern Plains tribes and was likely designed after seeing European muskets used as a club. So, basically, you have these long-ass muskets that after you shoot, you can swing and bash someone with, and the Native Americans are like... All right, yeah, well, that's a cool design, so we'll make it look like this gun. Right, but we don't have the ability to make a gun, so we'll just put a spear through this thing, <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be a pretty awesome and deadly weapon. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. So, parameters for this thing, it must be in a fawn's foot shape, um, between 28 and 30 inches long, and the attached blade must be between 5 to 8 inches long. So... Lee grabs a higher carbon piece of steel and starts by forging a blade. Uh, designs this handle to fit his hands, thinking Zeke's got similar sized hands, and in grinding it, takes off way too much material, which could possibly not leave enough to give the fawn's foot design. Right, the fawn's foot being basically looking like a fawn's foot, like the, the way that the hoof uh, tapers outward. Right. And so just to give something to kind of help hold onto the bottom of the, the the base of the handle. And then he's just moving along, and that's pretty much it for his footage. Mm-hmm. Moving on to Brian, uh, chooses walnut for his stock, and decides to go with a freeform design. Great idea, buddy. <laughs> Once he's happy with the blade profile, he moves on to the gun stock and immediately doesn't give the proper style of elbow. Yeah, like right off the bat. They're watching him, and they're like, well, that's not right. That's yeah. just not what it's supposed to look like at all, but okay. <laughs> so then he makes a recurve blade, hardens it, and then doesn't have enough clearance to get the tang inserted. So he just keeps smashing it down, trying to force it in, and makes all the judges cringe. Uh, eventually does get it in, in place. Yeah. Um, and adds brass tacks, let her make it look authentic. Uh, moving on to Nick, he chooses a sturdy-looking wood, but admits uh, the blade is his biggest challenge. With around three hours left, he starts making the first blade he's ever made and chooses to make a hatchet type of blade. Right. So, interesting. I- interesting choice since, I mean, it's a spear. Then right. That they show. That it needed to be a spear. Like That was part of the direction. Yeah. I, at this it, point, no. Every well, the main, the first guy was pretty much on task. The other guy was like, "Whatever, I'll do my own thing." Yeah. And Nick was just like, "I don't like this blade, and I've never made a blade. I've so never just, made a blade, so I'm gonna make it flat." Yeah, I'm not gonna make it with a point. You just grind <laughs> a point into it. Yeah, he he should have been able to get a point on there, but oh well. So we we'll move into testing. Yeah. For the testing. The war clubs, these were meant for bludgeoning and piercing damage, a.k.a. the sharp point on that blade. So they will be judged on three (laughs) criteria. Blunt force trauma. Will it damage the meat and bone when used to bludgeon? Blade effectiveness. Will it stab through the thick meat and tissue? And then integrity of the weapon. Will it stay together during these tests? Lee was happy to go first. And his does lots of damage. It breaks bones. It just cuts through it. No problem. The judges say it looks great. The blade made deep cuts. When using the blunt side, though, the long blade 
was extremely long, so it was concerning because Zeke couldn't get a full wind up without the blade kind of yeah. coming close to him. Right. And it also was missing the fawn's foot on the handle. Now, I noticed for all these tests, but I'll bring it up here because it's funny to me that when Zeke swings a weapon like that, it doesn't look like he's swinging very hard, but you can see how hard it's hitting. Yeah. He's just such a big guy with natural <laughs> leverage that he's just demolishing this stuff, but it doesn't look like he's doing like a huge baseball bat right. like wind up. He's just like, boop, but it's just like, boom. <laughs> So Cracking ribs. Yeah, it's it's a pretty impressive. So for Nick, his did some damage, broke a rib, but he didn't give a point on that blade, and there was some resistance when it came to right. piercing the meat. So kind of saw that coming. Uh, the judges said that the blade choice was inaccurate and the finish work was very rough. Not looking so hot for Nick. And then for Brian, his did serious damage, uh, broke ribs, cut right through. Uh, the judges said uh, he didn't have the gunshot stock shape right, but he did have the fawn's foot for the handle, and it handled well, and the decorations look great. It is the least historically accurate, though, out of all. Which uh, it was a little confusing. Like, it's decorated well. I think the design but... the design was what was least, least historically yeah. accurate of the, the shape itself. But the decorations were of the that historically accurate aspect. As opposed, I mean, to Nick, his blade was inaccurate. And it just looked nowhere near as nice. Right. But anyway, because of that, Nick got the boot. And my personal opinion was that the blade design was what did him in. The non-sharp point, the, just the, the hatchet-style blade was just yeah. a little bit too much for the judges to accept and they could look past the issues with Brian's due to the fact that this blade was so far off. It would have been, I think pretty close if they, between him and Brian, if he had that blade, you know, with a point on it. Right. It's like every one of them missed a piece of right. the parameters. Yep. One had the missing fawn's foot and one had the blade issue and one had the shape of the, the stock. Right. But of those three, the blade was the one that didn't perform in the test. Right. So then we have the master build challenge. Um, Brian and Lee are given four days to make European flint lock blunderbuss, which was the, you, oh, which one was it from Looney Tunes? That had the Elmer Fudd. The Elmer Fudd, Fudd gun. Yeah. And Teresa made mention today, seems like they're doing a lot of flint lock weapons. Every master build challenge has been a flint lock. Something. Something. And it's probably just the time frame that they're choosing weapons from, yeah. though. Yeah. Just an interesting thought because it, yeah. It maybe they just not, make working their way up from, you know. His, you want to know what I think maybe it is? It's got to be easier to make an ignition device using flintlock than it is a pin for like a normal style firearm, right? That have the pin ignition. Yeah. If you're just lighting something within there right. with a little bit of flint, that's got to be easier to put together is my guess. Just my I'd guess. I'd probably say so. Yeah. Because, Cause that's I mean, look, at, that's how things evolve over time. Like, you start off a simple method. Now things are, you know, complicated. Right. So you start simple and you work to complicate it. You know, it's not the other way around typically. I don't know when the pin ignition <laughs> method, I don't even know if that's the right way to call it, but I don't know when that started. And if that was after the invention of the production line and, like, the interchangeable right. gun parts and things like that. So if there's modern machining that went into that, that's probably why they try to keep that out of it. Yeah. Anyway. So the blunderbuss is the granddaddy of the shotgun. It was designed to shoot off a number of lead balls with one shot and was famously used by pirates, privateers, and navies. The parameters is that it needs to be 30 to 35 inches long, a minimum of one and a half inch muzzle flare, and assemble a working flintlock mechanism. So for Lee, day one, told his wife, I'm probably going to be stuck building a blunderbuss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. Starts day one by working on the barrel. Ground the barrel into an octagon shape. He's a little concerned about the flaring the barrel. 
Um, he broke the hardy tool used for flaring the barrel by trying to bend the metal on it and hits himself in the head. Oof, that yeah. was rough. Yeah. Um, breaks the hardy tool a second time. On day two, starts working on a butt plate for his stock. He treat the frizzin. I don't know how that was spelled, but that's how I heard it, was frizzin. <laughs> and so that's how I wrote it. Um, his crack's all over, so he has to weld it up. On day three, starts fitting pieces into his stock, uses oil to help identify high spots in the wood. And on day four, working on the finish and stains the wood. Yeah, the oil trick was kind of neat to see, like, you know, a little trick oh, of the yeah. trade, you know. For Brian, on day one, um, he's owned a blunderbuss in the past, and is okay with the challenge. Starts by working with walnut wood to make the gun stock. Welds the rear tang onto his barrel metal. He's not a welder. Hey, I spe- frizzin is actually the right spelling. I spelt it right. What is frizzin? The frizzin is historically called the steel. is an L-shaped piece of steel hinged at the front used in flintlock firearms. Huh. Good job, buddy. Woo! <laughs> Back to Brian, day two. Uh, it's a new day and a new start, so he picks new wood. Decides to flare out his barrel by drilling a bunch of holes around the muzzle. Hold on, hold on. He started over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just completely started over on day two. He just gave up on everything he worked yep. on. Um, so he flared his barrel by drilling a bunch of holes. Yep. Which was kind of <laughs> a cool method. That's what I was thinking. It was a very ingenious method for being able to taking out some mass to make yeah. it spread easier. And then he heated it up, putting on the tapering hardy tool, and hopefully the shape will form easier. The idea works well. He treats his frizzin and it comes out good. Day three, starts working on getting the barrel in the wood. He's okay with a crude look to go along with it being a pirate weapon, so he kind of just, you know, rolls with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, works on getting the holes drilled for the firing mechanism. And on day four, does some minor grinding to fix the frizzin, uses a light polyurethane finish. Okay, moving on to testing. Well, once again, Nick Irving, Special Ops Badass, is going to test these weapons. Yeehaw! Let's go. So, test part one. They're going to test the spread of the shot by firing into a wall of light bulbs. Test part two, he's going to reload the weapon while moving on to the second target. And test part three, he's going to fire into a block of ice to determine the stopping power at close range. That's cool that part of the test is the reloading of it. Yeah. Yeah. It really puts a historic element to it. Like, you got to reload it on the, you know, when you're... On the move. On the move. So, so for Brian, Nick says it performed great. The flared muzzle served its purpose. The large stock made it easy to control, but also had a lot of recoil. Uh, there was mostly a vertical spread on the light bulbs. Uh, good power on the ice, but the spread was inconsistent. Yeah, the, the shots were all over the place. Yeah. There. But again, easy to reload. Still had some good stopping yeah. power. So for Lee, Nick says it will hit right where he was aiming on the light bulbs with pretty good spread and good spread and power on the ice block. But the reloading was bad. Yeah. Like, it took a long time for Nick to <laughs> just get that whole thing in there. It was, you know, that's, there was fl- hardly any flair to that blunderbuss. Mm-hmm. So on the judging piece for Brian, Zeke says there's no rhyme or reason to what the spread was doing. Ashley mentioned that a rougher looking pirate blunderbuss, the spread was off. There's a gap between the lock plate and the stock. Yeah, there was a pretty noticeable hole between there yeah. that like he just machined out a hole way too big and then didn't have a big enough piece to cover it. Yeah. And Trenton says the method he used to flare barrel caused the spread to be erratic. I don't know enough about gunsmithing to say really what you can do to control that. I mean, it it didn't look like it was oblong or anything to me. It looked round. I don't know what you could do any better to actually control that. <laughs> right. Um, unless, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, it's hard to say, but it was he was saying... Uh, Trenton was saying how you could see kind of chop marks. The where where they were placed, it again, it didn't necessarily seem to me like that would have affected how they exited. But it's yeah. hard to tell. I mean, without seeing like a slow motion view of them coming out, 
how they actually interact with the barrel at that point. Um, but this is a good time to mention that in the commercial break, they have been showing on each episode a little bit of either Trenton or Ashley or, or Zeke talking yeah. about something. And for this one, they showed Trenton showing the proper way to flare out a barrel. And that was it was really interesting to watch him yeah. do it because neither of these guys did it this way, but he used the horn on the anvil right. to spread it. And I think that's a, a lot stronger than trying to use a hardy tool that's sticking the top of the anvil. The way he spread it out was by taking a, a peen hammer that has, it comes to like an, an edge on the back, and then you hit that, and that basically helps spread the material out. So that would have been the proper way to spread the material, and then you hammer it around on the horn, and then you have to upset the material and move it back so you're hitting on the edge of it to kind of keep all the metal from getting too thin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the method of it was awesome to see. Yeah. Uh, that's something that they don't really do on Forge and Fire. No, I, I really appreciate this is how you do it. Yeah. You know, the proper mo method to do that. It was it was cool. I liked it. So anyway. Uh, so for Lee, Zeke said it was a great spread pattern, but the reloading was a big fail. Um, Ashley said the flared end and reloading was a big issue. Trenton was quite impressed with the craftsmanship of the build. Right. Um, and Lee, you're going home with $10,000 and the title of Master of Arms. I made a note. That's still such a nerve-wracking wracking way to yeah. say that he won. Usually it's like, Lee... I'm sorry, you got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> so, so that was it. That yeah. Was the episode. Lee um, won ooh, with the bad, well, good spread and bad reloading. Right. But maybe. Craftsmanship kind of helped weigh that in his favor. I think so. Um, and even, although it was funny, I didn't make a note of it here, but I do remember Trenton said, you made your barrel a hexagon shape. But Lee said he made it an octagon shape. Oh. And so now I'm considering, like, was it which one was it? Because I could have sworn. I thought both of them said octagon. No, Trenton said hexagon. Oh, maybe he meant octagon. I think he maybe meant octagon. So but anyway, I think octagon's the the shape that those barrels normally take. I don't think it's right. normally hexagon. No, hexagon wouldn't make sense. I don't think. Anyway, it looked great. I, I mean, it was a good episode. The different. Challenges here were awesome. Yeah. Um, there's not much more I could say. I mean, I really enjoyed it. It's one more step of separating this show from Fortune Fire. And as each episode has progressed so far, they've gotten better about saying, well, these are the parameters. These are what we're going to be looking for. Historic or historical accurateness and accuracy is imperative to these things and yeah. they're making a point to say it so it's getting better with each episode and i know it's got to be a short limited run so they probably aren't going to be a whole lot more but i do know next week next week's Looks episode badass. is it flintlock grenade launcher <laughs> yeah. what the frick yeah. holy cow i can't wait to see that episode. it's gonna be a good one so like i got jazzed up when i saw z <laughs> post that today jazz but, hands Jazz hands. So that'll be good. <laughs> and that'll we can be... watch it on Sling now. Yes. And if you are cord kiters like us and didn't want to pay ridiculous fees for Comcast cable, you can go to Sling TV and get their blue package, which is their middle tier package, which to start off, it's like 25 bucks a month for like six months. And then it goes to $30 a month or something after okay. that. They just added Discovery Channel and a few other channels within that corporation that owns Discovery okay. to Sling. Nice. So we were on the fence about, oh, no, how are we going to watch the rest of Master of Arms? Mm. But we can watch it now. All right. We're on Sling. And we are not sponsored by Sling. We're not just sponsored so by know. Sling. But we, not yet. We, <laughs> we do like the idea of cord cutting and getting rid of some of these cable things. And we are proponents for doing stuff like that. And- I like how Sling has worked out for us. The service works really well. We just happen to have a TV that has it built in and makes it that much simpler for us. To and record. the one remote. Yeah, Ooh. one remote for right. the whole TV system. 
It's a good thing. Yeah. Anyway, watch Master of Arms. If you aren't already, it's a good show. And keep an eye out because we might have some interviews with people from Master of Arms very soon. Okay. And in the meantime, remember to like and subscribe on the YouTube, the Facebook. <coughs> Instagram. Instagram. Everything else. Leave us a rating on your podcast app of choice, like Spotify, which is where we are now on top of all the other podcasting things out there. And that's it. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you for all the support. We appreciate it. We will catch you next time. It was. Yeah. We didn't introduce ourselves at all today. Uh, we haven't the last few times. No? I don't think we need to anymore. If people are watching, we should know who we are now. I recommend it to other people. I'm pretty sure people can figure out who I am. <laughs> <laughs>